What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week 10. My God, we're in double digits already. Week 10 of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2021 CFL regular season and postseason. And in week nine, it was right in front of me. It was right in my hands. A, a great week. And then the last game of the week happened. And I got reverse swept, and I wound up six and six. So uh, even money last week, two and two straight up. Did go three and one against the spread. So the spread picks might be starting. You know, might be we might be getting a better handle on things here. Three and one last week, which is great. Only went one and three on the total. So obviously we gave that back. Six and six overall for fifty percent on the week. Seventeen and seventeen straight up. Sixteen and eighteen against the spread. So only two games back there. Thirteen and twenty one on the totals, which is very bad, very very bad. But we'll see what we can do here in the back half of the season to turn that around. Forty six and fifty six on the season. It's only forty five point one percent. But last week I was forty four point four four percent. So that's better, right? We've got a massive week in the CFL this week with five games on the slate, two teams playing two games in the span of like five days. It's ridiculousness. But let's talk about CFL fantasy because despite having, you know, a solid week, a fairly average week for me, I did drop four spots in the official Atlantic Schooners CFL Fantasy Football League from eighth down to twelfth. 72.6 points in week nine leaves me with exactly 703 points overall on the season through nine weeks. My week nine MVP, Saskatchewan running back William Powell, a very solid game, 106 all-purpose yards, 11 carries for 66 and a touchdown, adding five catches for 40 yards in the receiving game. It was worth 21.6 points, so obviously there he's got about... He's got better than a quarter of my overall fantasy output. Week 10 obviously is going to be fun and weird because we've got two teams playing two games, which means stats for both games are going to count. It works differently than like DraftKings or FanDuel. With CFL Fantasy, the stats all count, which means the cost of those players tends to be inflated. But my Week 10 CFL Fantasy lineup is now right in front of your eyes. So even though... There are some inflated costs on my quarterback, one of my running backs, and one of my wide receivers. The cost was still worth the play to me. Caleb Evans, I think, is the only viable fantasy quarterback to play in Week 10. He only cost $7,500 on a $40,000 budget, and he's going to play twice. He's going to start both of those games. He was still one of the cheapest quarterback options, so we're grabbing him all day long. I'm going to take Timothy Flanders because he's been getting volume in Ottawa's offense such as it is. He's going to play two games. The first game goes up against one of the worst run defenses in the CFL, so I really like Flanders for that first game, and it's worthwhile because he's going to get two full games full of stats. And we're going to roll out William Powell here one more time. He was my MVP last week. Let's see if he can put up back-to-back -back performances. Going to grab Nick Dembski in the Bombers receiving core because of, of course, the news with Kenny Lawler. I had certainly thought about Darvin Adams in this spot as well, but I think Dembski's more reliable. Going to grab Curly Gittens Jr. He has got himself a role carved out in this Toronto Argos offense, and the cost on him was just very, very low. I think he was only around... $4,000, something like that. And Kyan Schaefer Baker, KSB as I like to call him, same deal. His cost was only around 4000 I think he's one of the more viable riders, uh, wide receivers. So we're going to go ahead and grab him in the flex spot. I think there's plenty of value in those last couple of picks. Once again, going to ride no defense. So somehow in week 10, we actually have a team that's on a buy. Like BC does not play this week despite the fact that two teams are playing two games and there's five games in the week. But in any case, BC is on the natural buy. We've got Ottawa at Toronto, and then Ottawa then goes to Montreal on Monday. We've got Toronto then at Hamilton that also takes place on Monday. So Ottawa and Toronto are our two teams here that have to play two games this week. We've also got Edmonton in Winnipeg to take on the Bombers and the rematch Calgary and Saskatchewan from last week, this time at Mosaic Stadium. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to start with that Ottawa-Toronto game, and then I'm going to talk about the two games taking place on Monday, that being Ottawa at Montreal and Toronto at Hamilton. 
We'll talk about the other two games then on the other side of, of course, the Nerd Tease break. But I just thought I would put those three games together because, look, we're talking about two teams having to play two games in a very short amount of time. And with those two teams, that being Ottawa and Toronto, for the second games, rather than chewing my food a second time, we'll give them a little do's and don'ts treatment. So, Ottawa visiting Toronto. The Argos are going to come into this game off of the bye that they had last week. Ottawa coming in off their second victory of the season. That was a 34-24 win against the Edmonton Elks. Ottawa now 2-5 and five on the season. And look... For my wrestling fans out there, remember when Triple H used the theme song that began with Behold the King, the King of Kings? King Caleb Evans, folks. And look, I talked about him on the show last week, but Behold the King. This is your new QB1, King Caleb M. Effin Evans. I love this guy. Here are the statistics when the quarterback room was Matt Nichols and Dominique Davis. And this is like sort of in combination. They combined to complete 63% of their passes. They averaged 174 pass yards per game. They threw three touchdowns and seven interceptions. So a one to two plus touchdown to interception ratio. And their average QB efficiency was only 70.8. Caleb Evans in one game, 68% completion percentage, 191 yards, not lighting the room on fire with the yardage, but three touchdowns, no picks. How about a QB efficiency of 140.5? If you combined the average efficiency of Matt Nichols and Dominique Davis, so like if you doubled it, it would barely be higher than what Caleb Evans put up in one game. This is your QB1, and this is also the value of a capable offense because when you have weapons now like a Caleb Evans like a Timothy Flanders you finally found your starting running back it seems you it, it allows your defense to play better the Red Blacks defense generating three turnovers off of Cornelius at quarterback for Edmonton don't think that lasts beyond last week they also registered four quarterback sacks this was the Red Blacks best defensive game probably since week one ironically enough also a game against Edmonton also a game that Ottawa won the Argos come off of their bye at 4-3. and three. Winners last week uh, beating Montreal in Toronto. Sorry, not last week, two weeks ago. This was back in week eight. They beat Montreal 30-27. to 27. That game was also in Toronto. And now, once again, due to an injury, I believe, to Nick Arbuckle, it's right back to McLeod Bethel-Thompson time. And look, 68% on his passes, 210 yards, two touchdowns, no picks for MBT last week. He will certainly get the start in this game. And I gotta, I gotta kind of point out, I like the way the Argos are using Antonio Pipkin. There's a name from Alouette's uh, lore. Uh, and they're using Antonio Pipkin kind of in that Chris Streveler, uh, Sean McGuire type of role. He's carved out a role on this offense, both with his legs and throwing the ball. I always kind of thought he was a little bit of an underrated thrower of the football. What I don't like is the Argos run defense, because hoo-hoo-fa, um, a very leaky run defense against, of course, an elite running back in William Stanback. He carried the ball 19 times for a buck 33 and a touchdown in that game in week eight. The Argos allowed the second most rushing yards per game in the CFL. So once again, Timothy Flanders in fantasy. Now, DJ Foster, speaking of running backs, DJ Foster is actually going to get the start at running back in this game. I believe there's an injury to John White, or he's he may be a scratch, but I think it's an injury-related scratch. So DJ Foster is going to get the start. This is his best chance to steal this backfield. Because if he can play Ottawa, who admittedly has a weak defense, if he can put up a monster Austin Eckler-esque performance, both running the ball and... And as a receiver, if he can put up a monster performance, he may well steal this backfield from John White. The potential is there. Maybe call this my Caleb Evans bias leaking through, but I just have this sneaking suspicion that the Argos are looking ahead. Because they know they got to play another game on Monday. They know it's a significantly more important game in the context of the East Division playoff picture. Because that's when they have to go to Hamilton. I think they're going to get caught here. I genuinely think the Argos just got this suspicion that the Argos are going to use this as a look-ahead game, whether they're intending to or not. But it's tough not to look ahead and look at a Hamilton team that just got all their all-stars back. 
I kind of think Ottawa is going to catch them cold in this game. I like the Red Blacks to pick up the win here. And again, the Red Blacks in desperation mode, they know the playoffs are not as far-fetched a concept as they were when they had different guys under center. A benevolent king rewards faith. On the line, Toronto are nine-point favorites, so obviously I really like Ottawa plus nine here. I think this is a hedge one way or the other, but I really like Ottawa with the plus nine because I like them to win outright. Total in the game set at 46 and a half. I'm going to take the over on it, not by a ton. Both the public and the money leaders are on the over in this one. And uh, in the last three Ottawa Red Blacks football games, there's been an average of 49 points scored one way or the other. I'm going to lean over on this one, over 46 and a half points in Toronto, Ottawa. We're going to go Red Blacks 27, Argos 21. So after Ottawa travels to Toronto, they have to immediately turn around and travel to Montreal to take on the Alouettes. Ottawa in this game will either be three and five and winners of two straight or two and six losers of the previous game. It will be back-to-back -back road games now for the Red Blacks. And there's a lot of things now after playing a game early tonight, actually, Wednesday night, after playing a game early and then having to turn around immediately and play another game five days later, this team is not going to look the same that they're going to look in that game against Toronto. So, since Ottawa's already played, do's and don'ts. If you are Ottawa, do avoid the fireworks. The Alouettes are a high-octane offense. They go for big plays. They have talented wide receivers. Vernon Adams makes plays with his feet, likes to throw the ball down the field. Your kryptonite to that, the best countermeasure, is a slow deliberate ground-based game i think that is ottawa's best chance at making some noise in this second game in five days they have to keep this game slow keep the game deliberate make it a battle of possessing the football and the alouettes are prone to shooting themselves in the foot give them every opportunity to do so and if you're the red blacks this is very easy don't listen to the fatigue the fatigue is going to be up here right from the get-go and yes it is physical but the fatigue is going to be up here for 60 minutes telling you you can't do it and look i'm far from a professional athlete but i know some stuff that is going to be probably the biggest mountain to climb in this game it may be an insurmountable one but if you can climb that mental hill you might have a shot at this Alouettes enter this game at three and four winners in Hamilton last week, 23 to 20 in overtime. I talked about it. It was a season defining win, a season defining game, a must win game, even this early in the season for the Alouettes. And they had a season saving cardiac performance really on both sides of the ball, even like even Hamilton to kick that last second field goal to send the game to overtime to begin with. But that, that Gino Lewis, oh my God, that catch. That, that Eugene Lewis touchdown catch. Say what you will about Vernon Adams, and you can say a lot of things about him. Vernon Adams has guts. He shook off that early game ankle injury. I think it was like the second Alouette's drive in that game. He shook that off. He led the go-ahead touchdown drive late in the game. He showed guts. He gutted that thing out. I really like Vernon Adams. He certainly has his flaws as a quarterback. And again, Eugene Lewis kind of bailed him out on that touchdown catch. But the guy's got guts. You can't take that from him. Alouette's defense looked good in that football game against Hamilton as well. They generated four quarterback sacks as well as four pass knockdowns off of Jeremiah Masoli, who came back in that game. But look, you know what I'm going to say. You had 12 penalties for a buck 25 in a game where your season was probably on the line. Completely unacceptable. And this is what I said when I said to Ottawa, Montreal will give you opportunities for them to shoot themselves in their own foot. Let them do it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I've made a lot about how this is going to be Ottawa and Toronto's, but in this case, particularly Ottawa's second game in five days. They play on Wednesday, they play again on Monday. Uh, not only will it be that, for Ottawa in particular, this is going to be Ottawa's third game in 14 days and their fourth game in 20 days. That is brutal, incredibly difficult scheduling. And I think fatigue probably has to catch up to you, especially in the latter part of that football game. I've got to take the Alouettes to win this game. I don't think Ottawa is the team at this point, as much as I love Caleb Evans, 
I don't think they're the team at this point to win back-to-back road games only separated by five days. On the line, the Owls are laying seven and a half points. And I think I'm going to hedge my bets on this one as well, because who knows? I mean, look, you've got a king at quarterback now. Miracles can happen. But the Owls haven't won at home yet. They also haven't covered at home yet. And seven and a half points, I think, is just too much for me to lay on one of the more unreliable teams and undisciplined teams in the league. So I'm going to take the points on the Red Blacks. Let's go Ottawa plus seven and a half. Total in the game set at 48 Uh, 63% of the public and 89% of the team money leaders on covers are on the under in this game. That's the way I was kind of leaning as well when I went through, did my math, came up with my score prediction. I think this lands under. So we're going to go under 48 and a half points in Montreal, Ottawa. We're going to go Owls 21, sorry, Owls 24, Red Blacks 21. Pretty good game. And we talked about Toronto. Let's talk about Toronto's second game of the week, that being the Argos in Hamilton taking on the Ticats. Argos will enter this game either at 5-3, and three, winners of two straight, or 4-4, four and four, having lost the game against Ottawa, which, again, is what I think is going to happen. So, do's and don'ts treatment here for Toronto, because we've already talked about them. If you're the Argos, do sell out to get to Jeremiah Masoli. This is only going to be his second game back from his uh, was a rib injury, I think it was. Only his second game back, and look... The Argos only have 14 sacks on the year, but Hamilton has given up 24. Their offensive line is Swiss cheese. They gave up four last week. They're giving up the most, uh, most or second most in the CFL. You have to sell out blitz, blitz, blitz to get to Masoli. Because if Masoli doesn't have time, they don't really have a reliable run game. Sean Thomas Erlington can make plays, but it's not a reliable run game. So if you can get to Masoli, take his time away. He can make some mistakes. If you're the Argos, don't, for the love of God, flip-flop at quarterback. They've been doing it all season long. I understand why they had to go back to MBT last week. But look, if MBT starts the first game, which it looks like he's going to, no matter what happens in that first game, MBT should start the second game if he is healthy. An injury obviously answers the question for you. But if he's healthy, he should start the game. Flip-flopping at quarterback does not help you. The fact that the Argos are 4-3 and three is in spite of the fact that they have not been able to pick a lane under center. Ticats enter this game at 4-4. Four and four. Losers last week, that game against Montreal in overtime. That game was at home in Hamilton. But this is as rusty as we'll see the Ticats for the rest of the season. Like, look, Masoli came back, Braylon Addison came back, Brandon Banks came back, and they all came back in the same game. So this is as rusty as we will see this Ticats offense for the rest of the year. Because the more game action they get, the more reliable they get, the healthier they get, the closer they get back to 100%, they're not going to look like that in this game, and they're not going to look like this week, next week. Again, that all-CFL trio of Masoli, Banks, and Addison all returning last week to kind of middling results. Masoli completed 70% of his passes, threw for 223, did not throw a touchdown pass, but didn't throw an interception, which also matters. Braylon Addison, seven catches for 73 yards. He looks like he's back. Brandon Banks only generating 15 yards on four catches. And once again, they're just... Not throwing the ball downfield to Brandon Banks. And maybe that will come in the weeks to come, but you call him Speedy B for a reason. Like, like, toss the ball downfield. Now is the point that if you're the Ticats, now we go. They are the East's best team when they are 100% healthy. They have not been full strength all season. Remember, they started the season without Braylon Addison. Then Masoli gets hurt. Then Banks is out. So they've not been full strength all year. This is basically where they are at full strength. So now's the time. Now we go. The fact that they could be without those guys for as long as they've been without those guys and still be four and four tells me that they're the best team in this division. And it's only straight to the moon. Hashtag stonks from here for the Ticats. Look, for Toronto, this is two straight battles of Ontario. These are two very highly emotional games, probably more so against Hamilton than against Ottawa. I just don't think that's an emotional test that the Argos pass. And this will be officially the last week that I stop fading the Argos if the Argos sweep these two games. If the Argos win both of these games, I'm taking Hamilton to win. 
if the Argos sweep both of these games, I can't fade them anymore because I can't fight reality. On the line, the Ticats are laying five points at home as a favorite. I'm going to lay those points because I think that's the way that it ends. I'm not comfortably laying those points. Um, five points seems like a big number, but with how I genuinely think the game is going to end, the minus five is going to hit, so I'm going to lay the points. Total in the game set at 43 and a half points. I'm going to lean over on this one. This is splitting betters, but I just don't really want to sweat an under on a 43 and a half in a game that features Brandon Banks and Braylon Addison and, you know, McLeod Bethel Thompson and Jeremiah Masoli. Like, I just don't want to sweat an under in those circumstances. So we're going to go over on it. I don't think it's going to fly over, but we're going to go over in Hamilton, Toronto. Let's take Ticats 27, Argos 20. And I'm going to take this opportunity in the episode, as I always do, to shout out my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. Ladies and gentlemen, nerdtees.ca. My promo code is BWFINEST. And when you use that promo code at nerdtees.ca, what are you going to save? You're going to save 15% on your entire order. You're going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks, which is a massive, massive savings with the way shipping costs are these days. If you are one of my American viewers, you are going to get an excellent conversion rate on the US dollar, which is certainly important considering, again, you're shopping in Canada. Today's blend is Kiwi-licious. This has been a favorite blend of mine for a while. This is a black tea with real pineapple and real kiwi pieces. There's hints of lime in it. There's hints of blackberry. It's a very aromatic tea. It smells great, has a really solid taste to it, and it is one of just dozens and dozens of incredible tea blends that you can find on nerdteas.ca. Don't forget, use my promo code BWFINEST, save your money, get your free shipping, find yourself something to love, or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. All right, we still have two other games to talk about this week. We're going to start with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers hosting the Edmonton Elks. Now, Edmonton 2-5 and five on a three-game losing skid, now officially the worst losing skid in the CFL, losing in Ottawa that 10-point decision, 34-24. to 24. This was Cornelius' better game at quarterback. He's had two starts. It felt like he's had more than that, but he's had the two starts. This was his best game, completed 71% of his passes, threw for 334, three touchdowns, two picks, but it's likely that Trevor Harris draws back in for the Elks in this game. I think he was really raring to go last week and didn't. I imagine Harris will be under center this week. Again, Cornelius played better, wasn't enough to get the job done against Ottawa of all teams. And the reason it wasn't good enough to get the job done is when you put yourself down 14 points in less than five minutes, the game becomes very simple. You can either make the plays from there on out, or you can't. And, to their credit, from that point, they outscored Ottawa by four points, but they were down 14. I think the Elks can take solace here that a lot of the underlying numbers say that they should have won this game. They won time of possession. They had more total yards. They had better QB efficiency in that game. Uh, they had 5.3 yards per carry. So uh, there were a lot of things that led us to believe that the underlying numbers say that Edmonton probably should have won that game. But you can't get down 14 points in less than five minutes and expect to beat anybody. I'm also going to sound and feel like a broken record here in talking about the Blue Bombers because what else do you say about a 7-1 and team that's won five straight games? They went into BC and clobbered them 30-9, to a three-possession win featuring 417 pass yards from Zach Kalaros. Kalaros is not really looked at as like this monster pocket passing quarterback, but 417 pass yards against a very good secondary in their building is just a massive performance. BC made things easy on Winnipeg. When you're playing a team like Winnipeg, if you come out with a wholly predictable game plan where they know you're not going to run the ball, you're kind of making things easy on them. But Winnipeg's execution still had to be on point in that game, and it basically was from the opening kick. Now, for the Bombers, I kind of touched on it when I was talking about CFL Fantasy. Kenny Lawler has been suspended by the team over an impaired driving charge. He came forward to the team and said, look, 
this happened. I'm going to be charged for it. The team suspended him. No word yet on whether the CFL is going to do anything additionally. But it looks like Naaman Roosevelt is probably going to draw into the lineup for the first time this season. If you'll recall, they signed Roosevelt at the tail end of free agency, tail end of the offseason. I think he's going to draw in for the first time this year. And that just goes to show you the insane depth of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Not only are they an elite team, they're a deep team. I think the Elks can win the ground game portion of this game. Winnipeg is not very good at stopping the run, and James Wilder Jr. is very good at running the football. So I think they can win the ground portion of this game. I don't know where they win anywhere else. I don't expect Trevor Harris to come out and be a monster his first game back. Like, he suffered a neck injury, I believe it was. Either neck or back. I think it was neck. I don't expect him to be a monster when he first comes out, and... The defense is definitely not better than Winnipeg's. The special teams is not better than Winnipeg's. Most of the rest of the offense is not better than Winnipeg's. So I just don't see where else Edmonton wins in this game except on the ground. Clearly Winnipeg's game to lose. So we're definitely going to be on the Bombers in this one. Let's take Winnipeg at home to beat Edmonton. On the line though, the Bombers are laying 12 and a half points. This is tough because Trevor Harris can probably cover this number. I don't think I can lay that many points. Look, if there's any team in the CFL to lay the points on in this scenario, it's definitely Winnipeg. And they certainly would have covered this number with ease last week. I don't know. I just, boy, I just, I'm not feeling this many points. I'm feeling a lot. I think it's a two possession game, but 12 and a half is just too many for me. I'm going to take the points. I'm going to take the points with the Elks and uh, probably hold my nose a little bit, but I genuinely think Trevor Harris is capable of covering this number. Total in the game is set at 43.5 points. 69% of the public, nice, and 69% of the money leaders, also nice, are on the over in this one, which is where I was leaning anyway. We're going to go with the over on 43.5 points. Again, it's a tough sweat to sweat out an under on 43.5, so... Over 43 and a half points in Winnipeg, Edmonton. Let's take Bombers 27, Elks 17. And the last game we're going to look at sees the Calgary Stampeders travel to Mosaic Stadium to take on Cody Fajardo and the Rough Riders. Obviously, these two teams played each other last week. That was a 23 to 17 win in Calgary for the Stampeders. Back-to-back -to -back touchdown drives to open the game. Had Bo looking really good early, came back down to earth, but they clinched the game right at the end, a game-clinching interception on their own five-yard line. So this really was a dramatic finish to this game. It came right down to it. Stamps made the play to get it done. Yeah, Bo looked really good on the first couple of drives, but with you, look, when you look at the game as a whole, like Bo still doesn't look like Bo out there. He's not putting up Bo like numbers. 64% on his completions, only a buck 84 through the air. He had those two opening touchdown drives. He also threw a pick in this game. He's also averaging more than a yard less per completion than he has in basically any other season in his career. Luckily, the pieces fell together for the Stamps and they did end up with the win last week. And part of that was, hey, way to let Carry carry. Yes, I'm carrying this over from the last episode. They let Kadeem Carey run the football. It was 11 carries for 78 yards, which doesn't seem like a lot, but 11 carries is more than, say it with me kids, 10. And when they let him carry the ball at least 10 times, they tend to win lately. And when they don't let him carry the ball 10 times, they lose games. So... Again, wouldn't you know who won the pony? Your really good running back is important to your offensive game plan. For the Riders, now 5-3, and three, uh, losing that game in Calgary, a lot of the metrics by the end of the game did lean towards Saskatchewan, but much like Edmonton, it's tough to win a game when you start out down 14 nothing very quickly. It is tough to come back from situations like that. Once again, Sasky made it interesting, but couldn't overcome the kind of deficit that they put themselves in early in the game. And they probably left it on the table in the run game specifically. They only attempted 18 carries in that game versus 44 pass attempts. When you got William Powell back there, give him the rock and let him run it. A little bit more than that, like 44 pass attempts. I realize five of them, five completions anyway, went towards William Powell. So I get that. You're still getting him touches, but th 
there's got to be a little bit more balance when you're playing a team that you know you should beat. Also can't say that I loved eight penalties for 67 yards, but I've certainly seen worse last week. Montreal. Of note for the Riders, uh, just in the last couple of days, they signed Duke Williams. Now, he had been in Buffalo, I believe, on their practice squad. I think he might have played a preseason game or two. But they signed Duke Williams for the remainder of 2021. So, obviously, he'll have to fulfill his quarantine requirements. Won't be playing this week, but should be drawing into the Riders lineup soon. And when you think about Kyron Moore, Duke Williams, Kyan Schaefer-Baker... Like, this receiving core for the Riders is now undeniable. Their offensive line is certainly deniable, but the receiving core is undeniable. I personally just think the Riders are too good here to get got in back-to-back games by the same team, except maybe to Winnipeg. They got got to Winnipeg, but uh, to Calgary, I don't expect them to get got in back-to-back games. So like last week, I'm on the Riders in this game pretty heavy. I love this spot for Saski, and they're only laying three and a half points as the home favorite. The Riders at home this year are outscoring teams by an average of eight, so it's more than double what they're laying in this game, so I'm going to lay the three and a half points on the Riders. Total in the game at 43 and a half, and this is a game that I am actually going to sweat the under on. I'm going to take under on this one. The team money leaders are 73% to the under here, and there really is no public consensus. So I'm going to lean on the money leaders, even though it's a low number. I think this is the low scoring game of the week, potentially. So we're going to go under 43 and a half points in Saski, Calgary. Let's go Riders 24, Stamps 18. There you have it, folks, our elongated week 10. The picks are now in, and let's go over them here with you one more time. I've got the Red Blacks going to Toronto, laying the upset on the Argos. I like Ottawa plus nine, obviously, against the spread in a game that goes over 46 and a half points. On Monday, I like Montreal at home to beat Ottawa. I am going to take Ottawa plus seven and a half against the spread. That's too many points for me in a game that stays under 48 and a half. And also on Monday, I like the Hamilton Ticats at home to beat the Toronto Argos. I'm laying the five points with the hometown Ticats in a game that goes over 43 and a half points. I like Winnipeg to hand a double digit loss to the Edmonton Elks, but I am taking the Elks with the points in that game plus the 12 and a half in a game that goes over 43 and a half points. And I like the Saskatchewan Rough Riders to avenge their loss from last week. All of a sudden this is a revenge play, but I do love the spot. Saski beats Calgary in the rematch from last week. I'm laying the three and a half points on Saskatchewan in a game that stays under 43 and a half points. The Week 10 episode is in the books. If you are a Canadian viewer of mine, happy upcoming Thanksgiving. I hope you get the opportunity to spend a ton of time with family. Of course, you know, COVID regulations and everything permitting. I hope you get to see as many family members this coming weekend as humanly possible. Enjoy the games in Week 10. I know I certainly will while I'm in my turkey coma. We will see you again in Week 11. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and we'll see you next week.